Justin Bjork of Wall Street from Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I actually had him on only a couple weeks ago. He didn't get a chance to talk about his true expertise, which is shorting. He has over 20 years of experience shorting stock markets successfully. He's a hedge fund manager at Bearing Asset Management with partner Bill Lagner. Uh, Kevin Duffy, thank you for joining me again. Thanks for inviting me, Jason. Now, Kevin, before we start talking about how you research shorting and a lot of interesting things about shorting, uh, I want to ask you about Brexit and your thoughts on that. You know, it was obviously a huge surprise. Uh, how do you think this is going to affect uh, general stock markets, banking stocks, and currency markets? Yeah, this may be uh, one of those uh, sort of pull back the curtain uh, moments. And, uh, you know, I think sort of stepping back from uh, 10,000 feet, We've had this uh, this long. We've had many experiments in terms of centralization of uh, political power. Uh, the EU, of course, being one of them, but also what's going on with uh, with China and in Japan and in the United States. And uh, you know, really, when you look at this this trend, we're starting to see some cracks in that trend. Um, obviously, uh, Trump and and Sanders. But also on the left and the right in the eurozone, a lot of um, established parties are losing ground to uh, to the new anti-establishment parties. So um, you know, I think that is is sort of the key here that we're just we're starting to get those uh, those uh, early cracks in this trend. Yeah, uh, one of the things about Brexit, and you know, obviously independence is a good thing, but I think unfortunately these politicians, these central bankers, these bureaucrats that are still going to be in England, their their status, you know, they're interventionists, they're not free market, they're not li limited government people. Obviously, there's some exceptions to that, like Nigel Farage and some others, but uh, you know, I think even with the independence in England, I think it, there's still these. The, the people in power love intervention and central planning and stuff. So that's what worries me. I did a video on this uh, earlier in the week. I don't know if you saw it, but I was talking about, you know, even if Brexit did want to uh, win the vote and they voted to leave, that these central planners were still going to mess up monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, maybe I'm going to be wrong, but, uh, you know, I see more currency devaluation going forward now for the British pound besides just what's happened, you know, in the last 12 hours. Yeah. I mean, this was, this will continue to play out until it fails. And, uh, you know what we've seen is is there's a this um, polarization that's going on right now. I mean, you're either on one side or the other. You either view the world through this interventionist lens, and you are a part of the establishment. The media, the media, the mainstream media is no longer even has any pretenses of being objective. Um, the uh, unfortunately, the investment business, and I think a lot of these activist hedge funds that got that have had uh, really poor results year to date, um, you know, they're basically they're interventionists themselves. I mean, they've gone to all the elite schools and uh, Harvard and, and Yale and Columbia and, and uh, you know, have degrees in economics, uh, as do the central bankers. I mean, it's all one sort of a, a, a cult. You know, they're all in their own bubble. I really look at this. The bubble that we're in today is sort of the elitist bubble, the, the establishment bubble, and they're all delusional right now. So, you know, is this a, a wake up call? I, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it should be. But um, but, you know, knowing human nature, uh, it, it won't be. They'll, they'll remain delusional until uh, they're on death's door. Yeah, I completely agree. They're going to keep doing their policy. They're going to keep doubling down on the policy of devaluing currencies and increasing taxes to keep big government going. And then, uh, you know, what really pisses me off the most is they blame it on capitalism and free markets. But here they are, you know, intervening in markets. Uh, do you think, though, that this uh, Brexit, the actual vote in them leaving, do you think this is going to affect uh, the banking industry or the currency markets uh, over the long term uh, any more than uh, England actually staying in there? Well, you know, I th we talked about this actually the last time. Um, you know, we're short the the, uh, the big eurozone uh, banks, and uh, I mean, you ju just look at how they've been been acting really since uh, 2009, 2010. They had their big uh, post meltdown rallies, but since then, it's just been Chinese water torture uh, all the way down. And so, this is telling you that something was wrong with this picture well before before Brexit. 
Yeah, I completely agree. There was definitely something wrong way before Brexit. And we're seeing that with the banks like Deutsche Bank being uh, charged or actually admitting of guilt for uh, manipulating the gold and silver fix. There was them manipulating LIBOR and so many other things, uh, com other commodities markets and things that they've manipulated. Uh, how do you research your shorting ideas? Well, um, we, we, uh, we look at... Um you know, really a lot of uh, different uh, waves. You know, we're trying to look at the intersection of, of, of multiple waves. Uh, and, uh, you know, it could be long-term secular trends. Uh, it, it could be um, cycles. Um, uh, and so there's, there are a lot of, you know, we're, you're looking at, at uh, sort of pieces to a puzzle and it starts to, you start to see a picture develop. Um, you know, some of the signs would be uh, we're looking for it's sort of the opposite of, of what you're looking for on, on the long side. You know, keep in, in, in mind that we are really long term investors and we're long term short sellers. So, you know, we, for example, with um, back in, in, in 2002, when Bill and I started the fund, um, we started shorting Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac. Well, that was a long term thesis that we had, essentially. And it really didn't play out until 2007. It started to play out in 2007. So that's a pretty long period of time, you know, four, four or five years to wait for an idea to play out. Um, so, but we're really looking for, the, the key with, with our strategy on, on shorts is that um, theoretically you can lose an unlimited amount of money and um, and you can only make 100%. So if we're going to get into the, the short selling business um, and we think it has a, a place in the portfolio, you know, as a, as a hedge, as an insurance policy, as Jim Chanos has said, you know, it allows you to be more long by having, by having some short exposure. Um, but if we're going to look for companies that can go down, uh, our goal is to, to find companies that go down 80, 80 to 100%. And so there has to be, you know, something fundamentally wrong with the with the picture to start out with. Yeah, I've done some research. I found an old Porter Stansbury article and I jotted it down. I found it uh, actually last week or the week uh, or the week I actually interviewed you. And now I lost it. I can't find it anymore. But I remembered all the points there. And it was talking about Jim Chano's shorting checklist. He has a handful of things. Uh, general things he uses. Obviously, uh, I've researched Jim Chanos. I've read articles about him now. I, I think Jim Chanos said he, he'll read the annual report of a company three times, him and his analysts will, to see if their business model makes sense and how e easy it is for them to make money. But the checklist says he looks for companies where there's a credit boom that goes bust, uh, he's looking for companies where there's an obsolete technology like Kodak or someone that's about to lose patents like GoPro or something like that. Uh, he's uh, The number three one is he's looking for companies with too much debt on the balance sheet, not enough cash flow to pay off the debt. And the fourth one that I found is he's looking for fraudulent accounting like Enron. Uh, are there any other types of things that you think Chanos uh, looks for? Any big picture things like groups of companies that have problems? You know, I, I listened to that interview as well. It was, a, it was long. It was a great interview. And I, I wrote down the list. Um, uh, consumer fads was one that he mentioned. Uh, fad companies, um, and you know, I'm thinking about maybe this athleisure trend. Maybe, maybe that's a, a fad. Um, but that was one I remember being on his checklist. You know, some of the others escaped me. But um, yeah, I mean, with us, I think some of it starts with sort of the the, the business cycle and um, the the intersection of a lot of ideas. So we're really the the ripest environment for finding good shorts is when you're in a bubble. And I think to, to boil, all, boil it down, what we're looking for are companies that don't have, you know, good characteristics. They're vulnerable to disruption. Um, they're cyclical. They're capital intensive. They're very dependent on providing credit to the consumer or they're dependent on, um, on raising capital, Th those types of, of companies. But then we're looking for the the overconfidence, the hubris, um, the the um, uh, management that is uh, 
um, kind of drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, they're able to take advantage of all of the, the sins that committed that are committed during the, the boom phase, the access to easy capital, and they are sort of the abusers of capital. Um, so it's really the, the intersection, you know, when you see the, the two, the two sort of go hand in hand, you see the excesses um, in a bubble, you see the signs of, of course, uh, the intervention by the central banks, artificially lowering interest rates, but then it starts to show up in, in these signs, you know, in, um, in the abuses that take place by the, the operators of these, these businesses. Uh, I mean, even things like aggressive uh, acquisitions. Like I can give you an example, uh, Jason. A lot of times we'll, um, we'll, have, we'll be short a, a stock and, um, and, it, and we'll be wrong because somebody else will come along and, and acquire the stock. Um, that ends up a lot of times leading to a, uh, some really good short opportunities. And one in particular I can mention is, uh, is Caterpillar. We were short View Cyrus International back in, in, uh, in 2010 at the height of the commodity bubble. And this is a, a mining company, uh, a company that sold mining equipment. And uh, Caterpillar came along, new CEO, bought this, this stock right at the, bought the company right at the top, um, paid a huge price tag for it. And that, that business has just been a complete disaster. Well. Unfortunately, we lost money on Bucyrus, but we set our sights on on Caterpillar, and you know that's been a, a slow bleed, but it's you know it's starting to pay off. Now, a, another company that's spending billions to you know uh, build uh, an enormous factory, this Gigafactory that a lot of people think will change the world, is Tesla Motors. Uh, we've had this controversial deal lately where Tesla is uh, going to acquire Solar City. Uh, Jim Chanos has commented on it. Uh, what are your thoughts on this deal that's being done? Jim Chanos, I think, called it one of the worst cases of corporate governance that he's ever seen. Yeah, I think uh, the word he used was shameful. Um, yeah, the, the uh, you know you have SpaceX and uh, Solar City and and Tesla and um, what is it? The cousin of uh, uh, of Elon Musk runs um, runs Solar City and and he's got an, an money invested. Well. Um, SpaceX also owns uh, has uh, owns debt, some of the bonds of um, of Solar City. So um, there are, I mean, it's just incredible. There are are, are huge conflicts of interest, and uh, uh, you know, companies that are that are burning cash. I mean, this is like one of the things that we look for in in a uh, in a bubble are signs of of debt buildups, but also uh, malinvestment, and you know, you mentioned the Gigafactory. That sort of has uh, all the signs of of, of malinvestment. So um, you know, the fact that that he could get away with this, and I think this even raised the eyebrows of some of the long long term bulls on on Tesla. Yeah, he's spending $5 billion to build out the Gigafactory. And one of the things I've learned uh, since I've invested in resource stocks, stocks successfully, and I've read you know, value investor books about Warren Buffett about why not to do it, why not to invest in resource stocks. But Elon Musk is building an enormous factory for $5 billion. The, there, th this factory could come in, you know, delay. There could be huge construction delays. Uh, they could come in way over budget. So what was initially going to cost $5 billion, it could cost 10 15 billion, uh, you know, if there's cost overruns. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, uh, you know, we see this in mining. Look at Barrick Gold and uh, look at that Pascualama mine that's up in the Andes Mountains on the uh, Argentina Chile border. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that and uh, the initial cost for that and how much it's still costing them. It's like the one of the worst white elephants in the history of mining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the mine was supposed to only cost a billion dollars in uh, CapEx and they've already spent six billion and it's nowhere near production. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I talked to somebody um, who is uh, an investor in, in, in uh, mining companies and also uh, um, you know, fertilizer companies and potash and that sort of thing. And, and uh, he said that, that nine, nine out of 10 projects, mining projects will be over budget. The one in ten that come in um, uh, under budget are are all taken on during difficult times. Yeah, that's why I like the royalty and streaming companies because they don't 
flip flip that they don't fit excuse me the capex bill they just they just get their little cut of the revenue and that's it they don't have to worry about the cost overruns like the actual mining companies mm -hmm. that's when you can get into trouble now i mean tesla tesla has been doing to to add to your points there about tesla i think tesla did a huge share raise what in may and that was in uh after in february he had already raised money for the gigafactory and elon musk was coming out after raising the money for the gigafactory and saying we're not doing any more capital raises and then look what he's done you know in the months since sure Okay, well, I want to ask you about some of the industries and the global economy. Uh, do you think the global economy is collapsing now, or do you think there's there's some pockets of growth? I mean, well, really, we have four four huge experiments, and you know they all seem to be in trouble. the The China experiment, total total debt to GDP, grew by seventy five percent over something like a five year period. And whenever that happens, it's almost always it almost always leads to problems. So um, you, you have uh, China, you have Japan, um, and uh, now government debt to GDP is is two hundred and forty percent. I don't think we've ever seen that in the history of the the uh, the planet. Um, you know the experiment here. The, the global central banks, their balance sheets have tripled. I think the uh, the Fed's balance sheet has uh, has gone up five times since uh, since 2007. So we've had these you know four experiments adding adding the EU in terms of centralization, and um, and they're all starting to to fail. So it's it's hard to be really bullish on the uh, on the global economy right now. And, um, you know, China, we can start with, with China. Um, you know, that's led us to, to some short, short opportunities. I know Chanos is, is very bearish on China. Um, you know, the first area is we're trying to differentiate between, you know, kind of the, the tech China, uh, the Internet, um, you know, more of the entrepreneurial China and, and, and not really short that area um, and really look at, the banking system and um, and also derivative plays like like Caterpillar. Um, but then the the second area are really the the large politically connected banks. Um, you know, I think one of the themes that we have is that um, the survivors in in banking, the companies that uh, survived the last cycle are more emboldened in, in the next. And so. Um, and, and also, whenever you get these asset bubbles, um, you know, you can look at the banking system, especially, like I said, the large, large banks. Um, and, you know, that's a, it's a great source of, of short opportunities because they're, they're so highly levered to the economy. They are, um, you know, really, the, we believe, as, as Murray Rothbard and the Austrians uh, believe, that, you uh, um, that fractional reserve banking is is you know constantly flirting with insolvency and uh, so you know we've we mentioned the the eurozone banks we're also short uh, the large U.S. banks Goldman J.P. Morgan Bank of America but um, but also the Canadian banks um, you know there's a housing I believe there's a housing bubble in, in Canada uh, a resource based economy and. Um, you know, you look at the leverage, at least the quote official leverage of the Canadian banks, the big Canadian banks, and and uh, you know total assets to tangible equity, something like ten. Uh, I'm sorry, twenty times, versus uh, officially in the U.S. more like ten times. So, um, you know, those would be two, and and I can mention I've got you know I've got others that we can get into as as well. I want to talk about other short sellers besides just Jim Tanos. You know, we've seen them in the news and the financial news. David Einhorn, John Paulson, Kyle Bass, Bill Ackman. These guys have gotten in trouble with their shorts. What what types of mistakes do you think are common that they tend to make when they make uh, when they do a short trade and then the short trade blows up on them? Uh, you know, that's a good question, Jason. I'm not sure I've, I've got a very good answer because um, I'm not, if you could maybe give me a, an example of, of some of the shorts, because I know that they've gotten in trouble on the long side. You know, they've gotten in trouble with more of the uh, the Valiants um, and Sun Edison. Um, there was a lot of groupthink and um, um, Sotheby's. Now, Sotheby's hasn't blown up, but Sotheby's hasn't done real well. Um, so I'm more familiar with the long side. I'm not, you know, maybe you give, if you had some examples, 
on the short side, I could like Herbalife, like Bill Bill uh, Ackman is adamant that Herbalife is a Ponzi scheme, even though, you know, it's a network marketing company and he might not agree with their business model. But, you know, a lot of people make a living off the business. So, yeah, it's... Um, we uh, we don't have a real strong opinion on on uh, Herbalife. Uh, we had been short before when when these stocks were really flying high. I know uh, Chanos is, is on the other side. You know, I'm, I'm not. I don't want to be in the business of, of taking the other side of Jim Chanos, um, but but the the multi-level marketing companies have tended to be um, good shorts. You know, it's just not something that uh, that that you want to you want to mess with. But look, it, it's it's difficult. Uh, um, uh, Ackman, Bill Ackman was uh, was short MBIA, and uh, you know that was a was a difficult stock, but eventually he was proven right. So he may be proven right with with Herbalife. I don't know. Uh, what about uh, David Einhorn trying to short Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and them, you know, using uh, I think channel stuffing in their accounting? Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm I'm just not familiar enough with with that uh, that story uh, to to really give you a very good answer. Um, we. You know, we took a quick look at it. Um, it, it. We don't like to to short real businesses. We just have to 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 be able to visualize. We're not going to be right 100% of the time, but we we just have to feel that a stock can go down 80 to 100%, and we just we we couldn't do it. You know, one of the things that we do try to avoid in terms of shorts is is valuation shorts. You know, they have to be uh, fundamental shorts, and we have to have you know the intersection of these waves um, that will will come together and 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 give us a push in the right direction. Yeah, one thing I think Einhorn missed is how popular those K cups were. So yeah, they were using you know channel stuffing and mm -hmm. they were booking account. Their accounting was definitely crazy, but their sales were popular. It was a popular product. Same thing with SodaStream for a while, anyways. So these were actually popular products. So that's. Uh, that's why his thesis probably didn't work as well his, as he thought. Yeah, and it's a good point. And, you know, it's something that you can, uh, you can, you can fall in love with the, the accounting. I mean, the accounting is, is very important. And, you know, there are people that, that do a very good job. Um, uh, Don Vickery and, um, and Herb Greenberg, you know, they do good work. And they've mentioned uh, some of the aggressive accounting at a company called Signet Jewelers which uh, acquired Zales. We were short Zales, unfortunately, and that turned us on to, to Signet. But, you know, they've also brought up aggressive accounting at, uh, at Alibaba. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, well, it's definitely, well, it's something to pay attention to, but, you know, it's in terms of, oh, well, you know, inventories this quarter, there's a, there's a bulge in inventories. You know, you have to, you can't just uh, put all of your eggs in, in that basket. I mean, I guess you have to attack. It's like anything you have to attack all these ideas from as many angles as you possibly can. Don't a lot of Chinese companies though use uh, aggressive accounting? So you can't really just uh, say that I should short every single Chinese company because they use aggressive accounting. In fact, I, I would probably say the opposite that uh, it's it would be even more difficult to short Chinese companies because they use such a, aggressive accounting that most people don't even check uh, their accounting. Yeah, uh, except that you know, we look. Enron used aggressive accounting too, and and um, you know we can always make excuses for why we shouldn't short something that in the short run it'll go up, that that uh, the shorts will be squeezed or whatever. But you know that's why we try to take a long term view, and we try to you know have a, uh, a, a you know methodology that will allow us to 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 stick around. I mean, part of that is the use of of put options to to manage our our risk. Um, but um, it's, you know, it's very important to, to be able to have patience, but at the same time, be able to manage your risk. And another way that we manage our risk is by having a lot of ideas. And that way, you know, if we have, like right now in our portfolio, we probably have 50, a good 50 short positions, individual short positions. So, um, you know, it's all about position sizing. It's all about managing your risk. And we, we do that primarily with, with put options. And, uh, you know, if if something like like, for example, uh, Allergan, you know, we looked at Valiant, we were short Valiant and um, Allergan, you know, the same sort of roll up strategy. Well, um, Allergan, um, 
was able to to sell or is in the process of, of selling their uh, their generic division to Teva, and and so the picture changes. And the good part about that is that that we were able to take some chips off the table, and we have no shortage of, of great short ideas right now. So we can reallocate money into just the best ideas. Um, are, are you? Are you short uh, a lot of commodity producers right now? Do you th do you think this oil rally is going to stave off a lot of bankruptcies, or do you still think we're going to see a lot of oil bankruptcies then in the next two years? We are not short a lot of uh, direct commodity producers, um, but we're not long either. So we're watching this from the sidelines, and uh, yes, we you know being bearish on the global economy. I mean, we're short. Even though we're not short the commodity producers, we are short um, copper right now. And so, um, you know, we do believe that, that China at the margin, you know, back in 2009, 2010, uh, was, was really the stimulus provider of, uh, at the margin for the global economy. And, uh, you know, accounting for 40% for of the world's copper demand, that that's kind of over with the big infrastructure build. So, you know, we are sort of long-term bearish, but at the same time, you know, commodities have, uh, they've gone through a pretty severe bear market. It's a little bit more, more difficult, but there are, there are opportunities there, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure there are. I know Jim Chanos is, is uh, poking around that idea, that area. Uh, Valet is one that is very indebted. We had been short from, from much higher levels and, and we covered it, but uh, uh, it's just at this point, it's it's an area that we're we're mostly just sort of watching from the sidelines. Bigger yeah, fish we've to fry. Had a, oh, let the fish fry. Bigger fish to fry. There are bigger yeah, we, there are better opportunities elsewhere. We we feel. Yeah, I think a lot of the easy money shorting those has been made already. But uh, you know, if there is another global economic collapse, uh, the copper price and the oil price will definitely have uh, pretty large downturns. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think one thing I've noticed, though, about about the copper market, you mentioned Chinese demand. You know, we hear a lot of people in the commodities uh, area talk about, oh, there's going to be supply problems in copper. They talk about the supply side and how there's going to be supply problems in copper. What they do not talk about these commodity bulls for copper is they don't talk about how 40 percent. My, my research has actually said it might even be more than 40 percent of the copper market was Chinese demand. So there was, you know, a lot of copper warehouses where they were just stockpile the copper really high for many, many years, and they were getting paid to do that. And they were, you know, using copper as collateral. We saw this on Zero Hedge. There were articles about this years ago that uh, the Chinese were using, you know, copper and iron ore and steel as collateral in warehouses to do derivatives trades. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the real demand, because of central planning, it's distorted these markets, especially in base metals, uh, because unlike oil, the one thing I like about oil, where I think you know, long term, it's actually probably still going to have good demand for it, is it's consumed, it's gone, it's not recyclable. Right. But with these base metals, though, like iron ore, uh, when it's turned into steel, st scrap steel is there's a huge market for it, and same thing with copper, co scrap copper. So there, there's, uh, you know, it, it's not like these things are these commodities are being consumed and they're gone. Right, right. Uh, you know, I think another area that uh, that we've that we're focused on is the reach for yield bubble and the fact that, um, you know, the excesses right now are really caused by ultra low interest rates. And uh, I, I heard today that that um, Swiss 30 year bonds now went to negative rates. You know, we've got over $10 trillion in, in sovereign debt that it's negative rates. So, I mean, that's an area if you if you want to talk about, um, you know, that's really where we're, we're focusing. I think the commodity area was was a, a great. You know, that was the bubble in 2010, 2011. I mean, the bubble today is is reach for yield, negative interest rate policy, sovereign debt, um, some of the corporate financial engineering, um, that sort of thing. Uh, what types of companies are getting involved in that? You know, some of the larger bubbles I noticed there are the car companies with their subprime auto loans and the student loan bubble. Are there private companies that are, you know, packaging up these loans and dumping them on pension funds uh, again? Yeah, the auto finance area is uh, is definitely an area that we are um, we've we've got a, a significant short position in um, Auto Nation, Carmax. Uh, there are a number of, of smaller smaller companies that I, I, I won't mention. Um, 
that's that's definitely uh, I mean the whole consumer credit area is is definitely an area you know Signet Jewelers mentioned mentioned Signet uh, one of the reasons why we're short besides the fact that uh, you know they sell a a, a discretionary item um, and uh, you know a fairly expensive discretionary item you know they they're they're providing credit um, a lot of it is is credit driven. The uh, do you also think the home builders then we're going to have another type of a crash with the home builders or do you think that the rules have been changed enough by Congress? I remember uh, after the 2008 crash that Congress changed the rules and started giving home buyers these enormously large tax credits that uh, would help them repair their balance sheets and things like that. Yeah, we have a, a relatively small position uh, short the home builders, no, nowhere near what it was back in 2005, 2006. But um, there, it's, it does appear to us that, that there is a, a bit of an echo bubble. And uh, uh, I mean, home builders will, will not do well in the, in the next downturn. Are the, are the large banks, Kevin, are, are they the ones who are holding these student loan debts or are there smaller or are there smaller or medium sized uh, refinance companies? Because we actually, I was surprised to see this. There was a Wall Street Journal article uh, in the last month or two actually talking about how there's more than 40% student loans and defaults in the United States. So obviously that means there's a bubble and it's starting to pop. Yeah, uh, you know, we've, we've poked around, but we really haven't, um, haven't been able to find. We actually, uh, we're looking in the, the, uh, the REITs, the um, uh, real estate investment trusts with, ex with exposure to um, uh, college apartments. And, uh, but we really weren't able to find anything that, that uh, sort of met our, our criteria, um, but you know, in, in the in the REIT area, we're um, that that's an interesting area because that has participated. That you know, the REITs have participated in the REITs for yield, and um, you know, people just forget about how how leveraged these companies are, and and how much trouble they can get in into in a bear market. The uh, ETF, the IYR ETF. Back in in the 2007 to 2009 bear market went down 73 percent, and um, and mall REITs, the four mall REITs, were down an average of 90 percent, and general growth properties almost went bankrupt. So um, yeah, the, I. I I, sorry to interrupt you. I actually know a lot about those because my grandma, when she passed away, uh, she had been suckered by her stockbroker into buying those things uh, with, you know, her uh, when my grandfather passed away and this, her stockbroker had put her in that crap when 2008 hit. So I, I, my dad and I were looking over her, my grandmother, uh, past grandmother's portfolio, and she had a lot of that garbage in there that we uh, were selling in 2008, 2009, just dumping it, not sure if it would uh, survive. Right. Yeah, and uh, you know the the, the REITs. You look at what's going on uh, with their with their tenants, uh, the bankruptcies, the closing closing of stores. Uh, I mean, we, we mentioned Signet. Uh, they're they're in malls. You know, they they could have some issues. Um, so, uh, and and of course, uh, e-commerce, the the uh, the threat from from uh, from e-commerce. So a lot of things can kind of go wrong. And I just don't think the people that are that are piling into these, you know, so-called income producing vehicles, that's where, you know, that's where the public is from, from what I've heard, uh, you know, just anecdotal evidence from, from stockbrokers, uh, people are just saying, hey, get me some income any way you can. And so we, we really have this reach for yield bubble and we have this, uh, this sovereign debt bubble that, that's, that, that is an, an unbelievable. Um, you know, that's an area and it's an interesting area because, you um, with with sovereign debt, there is a with a bond, there's a limit on on how much the bond can go up. It's not like a stock that can theoretically go up uh, in, to infinity. Um, a bond, if you assume that it can only go to a zero interest rate, uh, can can only go up a fixed amount. Uh, there is a ceiling. However, what's happened? You know, we have gone into ne negative rates, but as you go deeper and deeper into negative rates. There's no reason for people to basically pay pay governments, and now governments that we're starting to see some of the, the cracks, the global economy having problems. I mean, it makes no sense to um, to put money into to government bonds. So there's a limit there, and so from a risk reward standpoint, I think you can short 
government bonds, German government bonds or Japanese, French, Italian, you know, we have positions in all of these. And um, from a risk reward standpoint, it's it's very compelling. Do you, do you think there's a possibility that these governments are just going to print up, you know, trillions and trillions more currency units to buy up the bonds? Uh, I know we've seen also, besides just that uh, question I asked you, we've also seen crazy, strange theories proposed by the Bank of Japan trial balloon that, you know, maybe they'll they'll change the bond duration to 100 years and just print it away or let it inflate away. Uh, do you, what, what do you think is going to happen then, how the government's going to deal with these bonds? Obviously, I don't think they're going to announce tomorrow that they're going to default on them. Yeah, I guess the the, uh, the honest answer is that I don't know, and I'm not sure that it really matters um, because if they if they monetize the 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 debt, and you know obviously this is what the Bank of Japan has been doing. I don't know what the percentage is that they hold on their balance sheet of, of all the bonds, but it's significant. And uh, uh, if they continue to do that, they will they'll create inflation, and uh, you know we'll win that way. And and I think either way, there's, there's such a, a so many different ways that we can win. Um, heck, if assume that uh, that this could somehow work, that that monetizing this debt could somehow work, and the economy uh, were to pick up in Japan, uh, interest rates would go up. I mean, we could we would profit that way. Um, we, I mean, this is the thing that's so crazy when you look at how these bonds are priced. And I don't think a lot of people that are buying bonds um, really do. Does the typical Japanese household do they really understand that when when rates go up, their bond goes down in value? No, but their their culture is collectivist though, and they're buying the bonds because they're hearing the TV commercials and the government is telling them it's uh, uh, for the last couple of decades that it's an emergency and they need to help out. Mm -hmm. So they basically, my my theory is the Japanese saver basically the last couple of decades has sacrificed any investing income that they would have gained to help out the Japanese government by uh, buying Japanese bonds. Yeah, that's sense. an interesting point, and and you know doesn't that sound like? Uh... Uh, what the U.S. government was encouraging with buying war bonds, and uh, and you know that set that set up uh, the great bear market. Uh, what was it a, a thirty uh, over like a thirty-five year bear market that ended in uh, in 1981. Yeah, but the thing about these the war bonds, though, Kevin, is that, you know, it's temporary that, oh, we're going to win the war and we're, things are going to get mm -hmm. back to normal. When you're in a problem with Japan, though, you don't know if it's ever going to stop. Uh, so it's kind of a perpetual thing uh, that what Japan's gotten its, itself into. I mean, bonds used to the funny thing about bonds, you know, now a lot of people like them for investments. They think they're safe. They uh, I read these articles, you know, in the mainstream talking about, oh, you should be in cash and bonds for safe haven and not gold. Uh, but, you know the old perception of bonds used to be that they were certificates of confiscation. If you go back through financial history at many of the different uh, governments throughout the, the years that issued bonds, they were always, you know, confisca uh, certificates of confiscation. Well, they were uh, back in the uh, late 1980s and, and uh, I'm sorry, late 1970s and early 1980s. That was the term they used, con uh, instruments of confiscation. Um that's yeah, but I, I, I'm talking about going back further through yeah. financial history, you know, when uh, in the English Empire, uh, also with uh, Venice, the Venetians, when they I think the Venetians were actually the first uh, Italian city state to actually start issuing bonds. You know, the families of Venice didn't want to give the government money even for an interest rate because they thought the, the bonds would go to zero or they'd be inflated away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, it's like it's amazing how much, I guess, you know, the control of the mainstream media and mainstream finance, how they've uh, changed perceptions about certain types of investments. Yeah. You know, I think another another uh, compelling reason to be short bonds is that, you know, going back to the idea of short selling, why, why you do it. It's an insurance policy. You know, it's a hedge. And, um, you know, we all have risks. We don't just have risks of, of our portfolio of stocks that we own. Um, but we also have risks in terms of our job. We have risks in terms of uh, the, 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 the government that is um, um, sort of abusing us and, and taking on all this debt and making these promises, these unfunded liabilities, you, uh, pension funds, uh, they're going to be getting into trouble. Uh, you know, what's going to happen? Are, are taxes going to be raised? So, I look at the as shorting government bonds as a way of, of sort of protecting yourself as hedging that risk. 
do you, do you think it's likely then that the governments uh, could potentially either start confiscating 401ks or IRAs, maybe not confiscate the entire thing at once, but let's say, you know, a year from now, uh, the banks get worse, uh, more European governments leave, Japan has problems, and then they start saying, uh, the United States starts saying, well, we need everyone to put one or 2% of their 401ks into U.S. Treasuries for, uh, you know, for national security purposes or something. Do you think that's a realistic scenario going forward? Yeah, I think uh, definitely. Um, you know, capital controls, uh, controls on uh, on retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks. Uh, you know, absolutely. That's that's all. Look, um, you know, these people will be desperate. Um, the good news is that we're starting to get blowback. You know, we're starting to get a backlash, and uh, hopefully, Brexit was the was the start of this. Uh, you know, my guess is that uh, by the time we get around to the election, we'll be probably, if we're not in a recession, we'll be we'll be getting close. And uh, and and I think, you know, Jason, we've had this recovery has been sort of a bizarre recovery where uh, it's been the tale of of two economies. Um, you know, the ten percent that that have assets have done very well. Um, it's the the ninety percent that that don't that uh, you know you're starting to see some signs the personal bankruptcies going up, suicide rates going up, even birth rates going down. Um, you know all is not right, and and I think uh, uh, you know Trump has sort of uh, played into these um, these concerns. So I, I don't I don't see all this you know what the government will want to do and, and is desperate to do. The establishment, the political establishment, you know, will they be able to do it is, a, is another thing. Uh, it's, it's going to get interesting. It's, it's almost impossible to predict, but it will get wild. Yeah, when I run into people who tell me, oh, I should put all my money into this one thing. Oh, I should put all my money into gold and silver here in the United States. And I tell them, you know, the governments are going to change the rules all the time going forward. A lot of these, I live right outside of Washington, D.C. A lot of these guys are lawyers in uh, who are making all these decisions. So they're going to keep changing the rules and they're going to try to do what's best to protect their own asses uh, so they can stay in power and keep their high jobs and things like that. Like the bureaucrats in Brussels, probably God knows what they're going to try to do to stop Brexit uh, going forward. But yeah, in terms of uh, you mentioned you mentioned the people who are making money off the asset price inflation. That's the Cantillon effect right there. So yeah, we know from the sales the last uh, four or five years after the 2009 reflation of the asset bubbles, uh, what we saw was you know huge boosts in sales in luxury cars and Tiffany and you know Prada handbags like the really high end stuff. And the stuff in the middle didn't do quite as well. The low end stuff was doing good because people were trading down from the middle class stuff. So, uh, you know, I think that's what's been happening. Uh, when these asset prices do start to go down, though, those luxury brands in retail, I, I know obviously regular middle class retail right now is not doing well. We've seen from the numbers from Kohl's, Target, Macy's, et cetera. But these uh, high end luxury brands that have been doing well uh, with the asset prices higher, those things are going to take a hit too. They are. And they're already starting to. I mean, you're seeing. You're seeing the numbers, uh, Tiffany, um, uh, I mean, even Sotheby's, Sotheby's, uh, the, the, you know, the auction prices, the insane records and everything that we saw, you know, a year or two years ago, that's going away. So it, it's all playing out. I mean, it's, it's, and it's starting to catch up. And what's interesting, you know, we, um, we, we constructed a, an index of, uh, of, of our, our short universe, 53 companies. And of course it's expanded. This was something I put together a few years ago. And, um, and I just looked at it, I updated it uh, before, uh, before we got on, on the program. And since June of last year, it's down 31% and the S&P 500 is only down 4%. So there are some, some real cracks that are taking place below the surface and and I think because if you look at the S&P 500 down 4%, you would say, well, it doesn't make sense that, you know, that, that Tiffany is starting to see a slowdown, um, that, that sales at uh, auction records at, uh, uh, at Sotheby's wouldn't be, wouldn't be so uh, predictable. But I think below the surface, there is a lot, there are a lot of stocks that are breaking down. And I think that, you know, this is starting to catch up to the top 10% uh, that, uh, that own assets. 
Yeah, Kevin, I, I think the central bankers, whether it's the ECB, now we know what their trading department, the Bank of Japan, which has been buying ETFs, and I think also individual stocks, the Federal Reserve has a trading department uh, as well. I, I think they buy these uh, index, the futures on the uh, general indices for the stock markets to try to prop them up, but we are seeing huge cracks in the individual companies. And you know, the jobs numbers that have come out, a lot of them have said that the retail industry is creating jobs. When you listen to the conference calls for the retail companies, that's not what the <laughs> CEOs of the retail companies are saying that they're creating jobs. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we have a huge disconnect. Yeah, I mean, it's and, and really the retailers just across the board, um, you know, which is why we're, we're, uh, we're short the, the mall REITs is that, you know, you're seeing sort of in that, that middle, you know, if you're at the, the high end has done well, but it's starting to have, like we mentioned, have have some problems. But uh, you know, and and at the the low end, the dollar store is doing really well. But you know, it's the it's the middle, um, you know, the Gap stores, companies like that. But I mean, you're even seeing it with a company like Restoration Hardware, which is which is higher end. Um, of course, they've got some exposure to the the oil states, uh, but. It's, you know, it's these cracks, they start, they start small and they just start to, they keep sort of spreading out. And I think the initial cracks were probably the China bubble. And, you know, now then you get the, the cracks in the, uh, in the shale boom and, but you're, and you're starting to see it, you know, you're even seeing it at the, the high end, the luxury market, you're, you're seeing it everywhere. So it's, it's amazing that, uh, you know, you got the S and P 500 4% off the, off the all time high. Yeah, and the banks are so desperate to, for cash that they're going after the cash value of people's, you know, whole life insurance policy. They're going after sweep accounts for all the cash for people who have a lot of cash in their stock brokerage accounts and things like that. So there's a cash shortage right now. Uh, you mentioned to me in emails that this will, you think the next six to 12 months are the best shorting opportunity uh, since 2000. Uh, in general, why, why do you think this is as good as 2000 then? It's, uh, it's broader. It's definitely, it's, it's much different. This bubble, you know, every bubble is, is different. Um, I was, I was listening to, um, Tom Woods, I uh, listened to a podcast and, uh, he talked about the, the money flows. It always flows to, uh, it's sort of the path of least resistance. It's, it's what he called the next big thing. And, uh, you know, back in 2000, it was the internet and, and then you had housing and, and, and today, Today, it's it's really it's the political class. Um, the political class is is uh, you know they're sort of in, engorged, and so I think if we look at all these bubbles, they're all different. But this one, we're just seeing you can put together. You know, the criteria is down eighty to one hundred percent, and. Back in the tech bubble, I mean, you could build a nice portfolio of shorts, but they would all be mostly technology stocks. And uh, you might be able to throw an Enron and, and a Tyco in there. But, uh, and then with the, with the housing and the credit bubble, they were the home builders, but they were credit related stocks. Fannie Mae, the big banks, uh, the mortgage insurers, the credit card companies, et cetera. But still a fairly small segment of the market, relatively small. Today it's it's more it's more spread out. It's definitely much more across the board. Um, and you know the idea of, of shorting government bonds. I mean, we never even thought about shorting government bonds back in 2007 or in 2000. So it's it's a very and that's that's a pretty big market. That's a huge market. That, uh, yeah, that you can and it's and it's not just the developed countries like we talked about earlier in the interview. It's the developing countries too. You know, if the dollar strengthens, countries like Brazil are in enormous, enormous trouble again. Look at how much their currency has fallen against the dollar. So these commodity rallies are probably, especially in base metals and probably oil, are not sustainable. Uh, that's given them a short reprieve. But uh, there's a lot of problems in the developing markets too because they borrowed and they leveraged their economy to China and that commodities bubble uh, earlier like you said. So I think, you know, the developing countries the next five years or so, maybe even less with countries like Venezuela, I think I read an article on Zero Hedge uh, yesterday talking about how basically Venezuela needs an enormous bailout from China. So uh, I think we're going to have an enormous uh, bond bubble in the developing countries, uh, in addition to the uh, larger countries like Japan and the United States and Europe. Yeah, I've been telling people that, 
as short sellers, we feel like like uh, mosquitoes in a nudist colony. <laughs> and, you know, another, uh, it's just another indicator of that. The, the difference, if you go back to the 2000 bubble and 2007, is that if you look at uh, median enterprise value to sales, um, much higher this bubble. So um, back in those other two bubbles, there were places to hide. Uh, back in 2000, I mean, you could have bought bonds, you could have bought REITs, um, you could have bought defensive old economy stocks. There were plenty of places to hide. There weren't as many places to hide in 2007. And this time there are, I'm not going to say no places to hide, but there are, um, I, I, you know, gold is a great place to hide, maybe gold stocks, but um, but there are, it's much harder to find good places to hide today. That's because since ten, since 2000, excuse me, Kevin, that the uh, all these central bankers have drastically increased the money and credit supply. So they've, you know, Wall Street has gone that trough first and they've bid up all these asset prices like crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kevin. Well, I just want to thank you for your time uh, today. Uh, if our listeners want to uh, follow more of your work, how do they do so? Um, we have a, uh, a website, um, bearingasset.com. And uh, also, uh, you can follow me on, on Twitter, um, Kevin Duffy 1929 on, on Twitter. Okay, great. Well, I enjoyed our discussion about shorting. Uh, let's have another one in the near future. Sounds good.